Okay, let's get started. Hi, I'm Susan Henderson from Disability Rights, Education and Defense Fund. Thank you for joining our weekly question and answers on COVID-19 and vaccinations. Today we have with us, Tony, and I don't know if I'm gonna say your name correctly, Tony, so go ahead and um, pop in and say your last name. Tony, Anthony, Tony. Chico Tell. Chico Tell of the California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, also known as Canner, who we Dredoff has worked with for ages and we really appreciate all your work. Um, so next slide. If you need interpretation today, we have English to Spanish interpretation provided by Leticia. You can go to the controls at the bottom of your screen and click on the interpretation icon and select your language, which will be Spanish in this case. Next. Um, for Zoom access, we have, we have real time captioning. If you go down to the CC, the con the closed caption button at the bottom of your screen um, and click on it, captions will appear. Our ASL interpreter today is Brandon. Make sure that you're in gallery view and click the little gallery view icon up in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Click ASL interpreter Brandon H, the three dots on his video and select pin video. When the slides are showing, you can use the vertical bar to the right of the side to make the interpreter's video larger. Next slide. Also, please keep your mics muted and your cameras off so people can easily find the ASL interpreter. Next. We'll answer questions at the end of the discussion of the presentation today. We had um, a couple questions submitted ahead of time and I'll just ask them for the people if they're not on. Okay, um, Dave, go ahead and stop sharing your screen and go ahead, Tony. All right, I will pick up on the shared screen. Here. And start the slideshow. So you're seeing that okay? Yes. All right. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Tony Chikatel with Canner. Uh, I'm I'm happy to talk about the vaccination story and long-term care because there's been a lot of success associated with it and things were pretty grim. I don't need to tell you in 2020, uh, but since the vaccinations come into the facilities, things have gotten so much remarkably better. Um, it's really, it's, it's a miracle to me. And I feel very lucky. And I think we should all feel very lucky that we had this, uh, this vaccine at our access. Um, I'll just give a quick explanation of who I am and what Canner is. Uh, that's a picture of my twin boys from now eight years ago. That's Cal on the left and Reggie on the right. And even though they're still pretty cute, I don't think they were ever cuter than they were in this picture. So <laughs> I, re <laughs> I really like this picture. Um, this is around Halloween time. So we dressed them up as monks. Uh, so I am from Cleveland, Ohio, or nearby Cleveland, Ohio. I grew up in Ohio. I went to college in Ohio. I went to law school at Ohio State. And by the time I got out of law school, the last place I wanted to be pretty much was Ohio. So I moved out west and got a job in Las Vegas. And I was a disability rights attorney for people with mental health concerns in the State of Nevada's uh, Protection and Advocacy Program. It's the, it was the Nevada equivalent of Disability Rights California. Um, so I, I really loved the work. It was great work, but I didn't like living in Las Vegas so much. So I moved to San Diego and became a, an attorney for a senior, a senior legal services program in San Diego County. And I really liked that job too. And in the course of my work with seniors, I did a fair amount of nursing home. I did a fair amount of work in nursing homes. So people with legal concerns that couldn't make it to my office for an appointment, I would go see them. And sometimes that was in a nursing home or an assisted living facility. And I was 
upset by what I saw, the conditions of the residents, um, the concerns of the residents going unaddressed. And given my background in disability rights, I was, I was pretty sensitive to the fact that there was a lot of what seemed to be rights violations going on in long-term care facilities. So as my work began to, I began to focus most of my attention on long-term care facilities and actually got a grant within our agency to do resident rights enforcement in nursing homes. So I started suing nursing homes in San Diego for a few years. And then I moved up to the Bay Area to go back to school. I got a public policy degree from Cal and started working for California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform. And that was 15 years ago. So I've been with Canner for 15 years. Canner is a nonprofit agency that advocates for consumers of long-term care services throughout the state of California. We've been, Canner's been around since 1983. And a lot of the work that we do is related to Medi-Cal funding for nursing homes. We do a lot of work, unfortunately, for on abuse and neglect uh, in nursing homes and long-term care facilities. And that includes financial and physical abuse. And um, the, the main thing that we do is take calls and complaints from people who are dissatisfied with their long-term care experience. And we try to help them resolve it. Um, that may be you know, engaging with the long-term care facility staff and management. It may be working with relatives to empower them to deal with staff and management. It might be turning their complaint into to us to a complaint to the state for investigation. And it might be um, us bringing in other resources, maybe some private bar attorneys into the case. And then all of this work with consumers and funnels our policy advocacy. So we spend a fair amount of time working with regulatory agencies that supervise the care provided to long-term care facilities. And we also write and support and sometimes oppose legislation in the Capitol. For example, this year, because of what the terrible experience has been in nursing homes in 2020, we have a package of seven different pieces of legislation. Some of it is sponsored by Canner, some of it's sponsored by some of our allies seven pieces of legislation to address long-term care or specifically nursing home reform in 2021. So I'm here to, today to talk about the vaccine experience in long-term care facilities. And I thought the first thing we should talk about is how the vaccines were introduced into long-term care facilities. So they really started in December, uh, right as soon as the FDA approval came in, the, the emergency use approval came in, I think that was mid-December. Um, there had already been a lot of national and statewide discussions from public health experts on who should get the vaccine first. And it was pretty unanimous that nursing home residents should be targeted for um, the vaccine, should, should, be, should have access to the vaccine before anybody, virtually anybody else. Um, so there was a concerted effort to get the vaccination into nursing homes as soon as possible. So the way it was generally set up was each nursing home got three vaccination clinics scheduled. And that's where pharmacies, the pharmacy nurses would bring vaccine into the nursing home and inoculate um, all the resident, all the willing residents and the willing staff members. And then there would be a second visit for, for the second dose and for a first dose for anybody who missed the first clinic and then a third clinic to wrap it all up. Um, and so the vast majority of residents who wanted vaccine and staff members who wanted vaccine were, were given, were, were fully vaccinated around mid-March. So it was about a really, it didn't really start going um, until January. There were some nursing homes like for instance, West Virginia was very quick. They had uh, residents being vaccinated before Christmas, um, but in California, it didn't really get going in earnest until January. Um, so it really took about just two and a half months to get the clinics taken care of in about 1200 nursing homes in California. Assisted living facilities were not, um, there, 
there's more variation in the assisted living experience than there is in nursing homes. There's, there's less regulatory oversight. There's significant variance in the number of residents in assisted living facilities. There's a lot of assisted living facilities only have six residents, whereas the smallest nursing homes usually have at least 20 or 30. Um, so the assisted living facilities, in a sense, were left to catch up. They didn't have the same um, formal arrangements. The government wasn't quite ahead um, on assisted living to make sure that all of the facilities were going to be covered with clinics. A lot of assisted living facilities were telling their residents they would have to leave the facility to go get their vaccine rather than having um, a clinic on site. Um, but generally, I think um, after you know a few weeks of some hiccups, assisted living uh, were, were for the most part right behind nursing homes and getting their residents vaccinated. And here's the results. Um, you can see you know, the, the orange line, the brighter orange line is the line of infected nursing home residents. This is just nursing home residents here, not assisted living. And you can see that there's this huge peak towards the beginning of December and then another uh, smaller peak towards the end of December. And that's when the vaccine clinic started. And then you just see this rapid you know, cliff dive downward on the number of cases. It's it's again, it's really just incredible. The darker orange line is the at, towards the bottom is the number of resident deaths in nursing homes. And the parts on the graph where there's no, where the, the darker orange line just disappears are areas where the, the number of deaths fell below 11. So when there's fewer than 11 deaths, the state doesn't identify them for fear of giving away a patient's protected health information. So um, anytime where the bright orange line ends, that's, that's a good sign. There, there were fewer than 11 deaths on that particular day in nursing homes due to COVID-19. So you see in the, in the fall, we had a, a period where the number of cases was pretty low and there were very few deaths, relatively speaking. And then it went way back up in December and then continued into January as all those people with COVID in December started to pass away. And then you see as the vac vaccination took root, by mid-February, the deaths fell below 11 and we haven't gone above 11 and any day since. So this is probably the longest period of relatively low deaths in COVID since, since March of 2020. So that's you know, a pretty remarkable turnaround. And then this is the assisted living experience. And I still don't really understand how this data, when, the, when there are bars on this graph, what they mean. But I think the key for me is this number here on the right-hand side of the slide that says 109, total active cases statewide as of April 22nd in all of assisted living facilities. And there's about, just for your reference, there's about 140,000 Californians in a a senior care assisted living, residential care facilities for the elderly. Of those 140,000 residents approximately, only 109 had an active case of COVID on April 22nd. And that had been you know, in the thousands just a few months before. Um, a couple of concerns, bumps in the road related to the vaccine, um, things that came up. We still don't have very good data on the saturation of vaccines in long-term care facilities. We don't know, we, there's no way for us to tell about a particular nursing home's rate of vaccination. And it's a little troubling because some of the rules related to visitation, for example, in nursing homes are predicated, or, well, some of the rules are um, distinguishable in terms of their application by the vaccination rates of the, of the residents inside the facility. So facilities with a vaccination rate of 70% of the residents or more have fewer restrictions on visitation than facilities with a resident vaccination rate of less than 70%. The problem is we have no, the public has no way of identifying which facilities are above 70% or which are below 70% or knowing what any particular facility's vaccination rate is. That's not being posted, even though we were, we were told or the state was implying in this back in December that they were going to put that data out and make it available to the public. Just this week, the state did release for the first time 
nursing home vaccine data, but it's very raw. All that we have is the number of residents and the number of staff people who received their first vaccination shot and their second vaccination shot. We don't know how big the facility is, how many residents are actually in the facility. So if, if it's 100 residents were vaccinated, we don't know if that's 100 out of 100 or 100 out of 250 if it's a large nursing home. Same thing with the staff. And we don't know how many of those residents are remain in the facility. So even if 100 residents were vaccinated, chances are good that not all 100 are still living there a month or two later. So how many of the current residents are vaccinated? This would be useful data for people who are trying to decide whether they want their loved one or they themselves want to live in a particular nursing home. If they can't get that data, which is a problem. So besides the data, another concern of ours has been informed consent. And this was you know, obviously more at the beginning of the vaccination process, although I imagine that new residents who are unvaccinated are um, being presented with the option of getting the vaccine and, and we still have, would have concerns about their consent. So my, my bottom line on this is corners were very likely cut, meaning residents, I am, I am more than certain, I'm 100% certain that there were residents in nursing homes who were vaccinated without truly informed consent. Either they were not given information upon which to base their decision on whether or not to get the vaccine, or they never really gave an actual consent. Their, their sleeve was rolled up without their consent and they were given a shot without them saying yes or no. Now, I have certainly not heard of any situation where a resident who openly objected was given a shot. That would be battery. Um, but there, there almost positively was cases of negligence where the residents were given vaccine without given the information, without being given the information uh, that would be useful for them to make a decision on whether or not they get it. Um, right when the vaccines were starting, there was uh, some debate among resident advocates like myself and facility advocates about what kind of consent was necessary. And just to give you an idea, the industries, the providers were arguing that informed consent was not required, only simple consent was required. And what is simple consent? Simple consent means that someone comes into your room, presumably with a needle and says, hey, I'm here to give you your COVID vaccine. And if you didn't say no, that was implied consent. Um, so that, that was their take on informed consent. So we pushed back against that. Fortunately, I got very, very few calls about consent problems as it relates to the vaccine. I only heard from two people who had, had um, said, for the, and they were representing their loved ones who were in facilities, were representing that they did not want their loved ones to get the vaccine. And in both cases, it was not administered. So that was good. Um, our big concern with vaccinate, va the consent issue and vaccinating vaccination of residents was un what are so-called unrepresented residents. These are residents who have diminished, significantly diminished capacity, generally don't make their own healthcare decisions, and they don't have a surrogate available to make the decisions on their behalf. There's a wide range of estimates about the number of residents who, who meet this definition of unrepresented. Um, it's probably somewhere between five and 10% of all nursing home residents, uh, at least at, during part of their stay, fall into the unrepresented category. Canner had filed litigation on, uh, on behalf of unrepresented residents uh, to challenge the statute that's used to make healthcare decisions on behalf of these folks. Essentially nursing homes themselves are empowered to make the healthcare decisions for unrepresented residents. And they, it uses a very, the statute is a very bare bones process to protect their rights. So we challenged it along with some of our friends and we got a good ruling. Um, unfortunately, I think a lot, and we're still sort of working on the new statute, uh, which should be done by the end of this year. But in the meantime, my concern is that a lot of unrepresented residents, especially with the providers arguing that implied consent would be enough, um, that unrepresented residents were given vaccine without actually going through the, the constitutionally required process to make decisions on their behalf. Another concern that I have is sort of the flip side, which is uh, for residents for whom consent would be an issue, like unrepresented residents, 
the nursing home may have just skipped over them and, and moved on and not given them an opportunity to get vaccinated, which I think would also be significantly problematic. Um, we knew for months and months that the vaccines were coming, thankfully. Um, so nursing homes should have been very prepared to have a consent process in place for uh, vaccinating these residents. And my concern is that some of the facilities didn't. But on the whole, I think um, things went about as well as they could considering how rapid everything moved. Um, one last slide about the, the impact of the vaccine on residents, on the, on the, on the resident experience as I've described. The, the really good news was on visitation. So the, the arrival of the vaccine helped push the government to require more reopening of nursing homes to visitors. And the one thing we learned that at the beginning of the pandemic was how critical residents are for the care delivery, um, how critical visitors are to the care delivery of residents, um, not only for psychological support, emotional support, but actual providing physical care. What we learned, what I learned after doing this for so many years is how many residents get direct care services from their family members, even though they're in a nursing home where the facility is paid, all the staff are paid to take care of every person, all the person's needs, um, they just don't get it done in a lot of cases. So the family members supplement that care. They're, you know, they're providing feeding assistance to residents, they're um, providing toileting assistance, they're grooming, they're washing them, they're helping them get dressed, all these kinds of things that family members were doing. And at the beginning of the pandemic, they were all virtually banned from the facility. So they couldn't go and provide direct care anymore. Um, over, the, over the course of 2020, visitation was slowly opened up, but with the arrival of the vaccines, uh, last month we had a, a pretty significant revisions to our visitation limits. And for the most up-to-date information about vis visiting loved ones in nurse both nursing homes and assisted living facilities, I put our website up here, uh, our, uh, the link to our fact sheet on visitation. Uh, we have a whole, we developed a whole website on the visitation issue, it's called visitationsavelives.com. Another issue was outings. Uh, nursing homes kind of went into lockdown mode back in March of 2020, and we had a fair number of cases where residents who normally went for walks were told that they couldn't go outside of the building at all, other than maybe in within interior courtyards. Um, we had a couple cases where residents said basically to hell with you, I'm gonna go for my walk, and they were refused readmission when they came back in from their walk. So we're not getting that anymore. Um, outings are now sort of encouraged again and residents cannot be treated any differently than they would have be, had they not left unless there is a known exposure to a person with COVID-19 during their outing. So they would have to um, go out, spend some time and then find out later that the, you know, someone that they were sitting nearby ha actually had COVID-19. That's the only circumstance in which residents can be uh, sub subjected to a quarantine on their return from an outing. Or if it, you know, it turns out that they went out without a mask, for example, that would be a problem. Um, another thing that came up was facilities where all of the residents were vaccinated. Could they be treated like households under the CDC guidance for um, vaccinated households? And what we've learned from the CDC recommendations are that households where everybody's vaccinated should be able to um, intermingle with one another. So the question for some of the smaller assisted living facilities where there's only six residents is if all the residents were vaccinated, could they be treated as a household and no longer have to wear masks when they're in the, they're in the presence of one another? So this was a big issue for a lot of residents. So you say, well, you know, we have to wear masks all day long unless we, stay in our bed. So when we have meals with one another, we have to wear masks. If we go sit next to each other and watch television, we have to wear masks. We shouldn't have to do that because we should be treated like a household. And essentially the state, well, initially the state was, um, didn't want to treat these facilities as households, even if all the residents were vaccinated and they, they maintained that they had to continue to wear masks within the presence of one another. But then they did away with that after some, some pushback. So Pretty much now the residents are in facilities where they're all vaccinated. They're able to, to operate as if there's really no pandemic at all, other than some limitations on their visitors. And the visitors, of course, have to wear masks when they come in. 
um, even if they're vaccinated. And then the, the one other issue I wanted to mention real quickly is during the pandemic, what nursing homes were advised to do and what they became pretty adept at doing was cohorting residents by their infection status. So residents with who were tested and testing became very frequent um, during the pandemic. Residents uh, who tested negative were put in what's called the green zone. They were cohorted in the green zone and they were allowed to mix with other residents. Residents whose status was unknown, they either weren't tested or had just recently been admitted, were put in a yellow zone. And residents with known COVID exposure or a positive test were put in a red zone. So facilities, the state became very comfortable with this concept. And, um, but what they never did was they never considered the residents themselves and their risk for tolerance and allow residents to sort of self cohort by their tolerance for risk. And um, it just, I mean, it's a, it's a pretty good example of the, of the discrimination that residents face. They, with the discrimination that residents face, um, and I'm sorry for the background noise, um, the, that they weren't given any ability to sort of take any control over their own ability to mix with one another and to see their loved ones and to be able to go outside. It would have been nice if the, the policymakers would have given them the ability to, to have a little bit of control over um, what they're able to do based on their risk tolerance. And that's all I have. So Tony, this is Susan. Um, thank you. I just have to say how grateful we all are for having um, attorneys like you and organizations like Tanner um, keeping watch over the nursing home industry. So thank you for that. Um, I did, there were a few questions submitted ahead of time and you kind of touched on every single one of them. Um, okay. And, but just so people feel like they get, it, when we post this, they have, you know, their questions were asked. So one of the questions was, um, my mother missed her opportunity to be vaccinated because she was in an assisted living facility, I guess, like one of the smaller homes. And because of a health event went into a nursing home that had already had its clinics. So she's wondering if there's a way to get her an, a, a vaccine inside the nursing home without ever having to leave. Yeah, um, there's been a lot of efforts made at the county level to ensure that people who sort of missed the initial clinics in any particular facility are given the opportunity to get vaccinated without leaving their home. Um, so, but it's, it's, it's different county to county and each county is using a different program to service sort of the, the in-home uh, senior population or disabled population that's not able to actually make it to a pharmacy or to a doctor's office to get the vaccination. So I would probably call the county's triple A service. That's the, every county has an area agency on aging. Uh, and most of them have, you know, 24 hour hotlines you can call and get information or leave a message and say, you know, what's this county doing to address the residents and facilities that, that miss the clinics so that they don't have to to leave their home to get vaccinated. And um, if that doesn't work, then I would definitely call the, um, if it's an assisted living facility, I would call the, the regional office of Department of Social Services and see what assistance they're providing for assistant, assisted living residents to, to get vaccinated in their homes. Okay, thanks. Um, then somebody wrote, I heard that a large number of nursing home workers chose not to be vaccinated. Does that put the elderly residents at risk, even if they were vaccinated? Or, and then I, just because you mentioned visitors, the same question for their visitors who want to come and visit. Um, the short answer to that is yes. Um, the, the unvaccinated staff have, have been a pretty significant concern, uh, at least initially with the vaccination, the, the rates of residents to staff that were being vaccinated was, was pretty disparate. The residents, we saw 80, 90% of residents getting vaccinated and something like 50% or less of the staff getting vaccinated. 
I think that number of staff vaccinations has gone significantly up since the early days. Um, I think there was a lot of hesitancy and kind of like uh, look, you're you know, looking at the side to see how other people that got vaccinated did before they committed to getting it themselves. Um, so I think that we've had fewer and fewer complaints about unvaccinated staff members, but there's still a significant number of them, which is a concern because we, we do think that they may pose a higher risk of bringing the, the virus in. And, and we still don't have great data on the efficacy of vaccination on older adults, especially infirm older adults. So there may, and, and of course the variants themselves. So there's still a lot of concern that there's, there's always risk of the residents getting COVID-19. And we've had a couple of reports. I know there was a, a nursing home in Kentucky where there was some unvaccinated staff members who are, who are thought to have brought a variant into the facility and three of the residents who had been vaccinated ended up hospitalized uh, with COVID-19 and one of them passed away. Now this is, so far the reports are pretty rare of that, but um, it's cause for concern. So I guess related to that is, can a nursing home require that their workers get vaccinated? And if so, why aren't more of them doing that? Yeah, I, I still don't know the answer to that question. It's a really great question. There, are, there have been nursing home chains that have said that they are requiring their staff to get vaccinated. My initial research on California law seemed to suggest that employers could not make it uh, a requirement of continuing employment to get vaccinated. And part of that was because the vaccine is still under the Emergency Use Act. It's, it hasn't been subjected to the full FDA approval process yet. Um, and then there's, you know, even if it had been, there's still some doubt in my mind whether employers could require the vaccinations of their caregivers. In years past, their um, nursing home workers have been given the option to not be, uh, to not get the flu vaccine. But if they don't get the flu vaccine, they were subjected to additional requirements of, of, of infection control, mainly meaning they had to wear PPE um, during the flu season. So I don't know if that's probably where we would be on uh, staff people who refuse to be vaccinated. They're, they're gonna have to wear PPE uh, for who knows how long, maybe when other staff members won't, no, will no longer have to, vaccinated staff members. Um, but we also heard, you know, facilities getting creative with uh, giving bonuses to, re to staff people who get vaccinated. And I think eventually the peer pressure will grow um, so that it becomes a smaller problem than it has been so far. Um, so I'll just follow the, um, I have one more question related to that. And then Lawrence Carter Long from Dredf has a couple questions. The, okay. um, so if you had mentioned the cohorts, that they were getting creative with cohorts um, with the residents, so is there a way for them to be creative with the cohort of residents that are vaccinated with staff that are vaccinated or not? I mean, yeah, I mean that? That, yeah. well, um, I could sort of think of the, op the opposite. You would want, you probably don't want your unvaccinated residents anywhere near the unvaccinated staff because of the, the high risk mixed with the high risk. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, I guess you know, family members and residents are going to start asking, you know, which which staff members are vaccinated and the ones that aren't. I don't want them anywhere near my loved one. So that that may happen. Um, can you can you re read the question so I make sure I got all of that? Right. No, that was me. Just that when you had talked about the cohorts, I was thinking if oh, yeah. they're playing with cohorts to figure out how to make it so people stay safe, is there? Can they also? Be, add to that mix unvaccinated staff members. And honestly, I'm not even sure they can ask if staff members are vaccinated or not, or can they? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer offhand. I know that um, one of the issues that came up with CVS and Walgreens, which administered the vaccine to many, if not most of the nursing homes in the United States, were requiring written forms be signed by the person being vaccinated. And it included health history, you know, for concerns about, you know, having a bad reaction to the vaccine. And the staff were being asked to sign these and then give them to their employer. And so that was revealing 
health information of the employee to the employer. So there was a, a rush to sort of fix that problem. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if ultimately this, the management of the facility has the right to know whether a staff person has been vaccinated or not. Of course, the staff people can voluntarily reveal and I'm sure most of them probably do, but I don't know if the, the management has the right to compel them to answer whether they were vaccinated or not. That's a great question. Thanks. Okay, Lawrence, did you? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Tony. A lot of a lot of really compelling information there, and and things that I hadn't heard before. Uh, it brought to mind um, just by way of of kind of summary. I'm wondering if you could give um, a little bit of an assessment. Maybe, uh, you know, there's an old proverb out there that says something about um, in every crisis, there's an opportunity, right? And, yeah. and, and I, I'm wondering if you could sort of assess or give us your sense of what are the top two or three lessons that we've learned or hopefully have learned um, over the course of the past year? And, and where, what are the opportunities within those? Well, that's a good question. Uh, some of the big lessons learned are the institutional model of care is uh, ugly and needs to be replaced. And, you know, I think we, as a society, we've been having this discussion, at least since the 1970s, about institutional models of, of care and congregate living settings. Um, we know that there's the, a greenhouse model for nursing homes, which focus, you know, tries to put people in small houses that look like regular houses. Uh, with a small number of residents, six or fewer residents, with consistent staff that are cross-trained to provide all the care that they need so that the, it becomes a much more family-like setting. Um, that turns out to be a little more expensive than the institutional model, so it hasn't really been supported much by public dollars yet. Um, we know that assisted living is probably a superior model um, in terms of being more home-like and um, the caregivers developing more family-like relationships with the residents. So, um, so not only is the smaller model with fewer staff probably better for the outcomes of the residents, it's much better for infection control as well. Um, the smaller facilities just did better because there's just less profile, less risk profile of fewer people going in and out, fewer people there on the, in the building. So that's one lesson is, um, and I think this will push, hopefully will push us towards um, looking at more smaller home and community-based service models. Um, other countries have those kinds of models. We can learn from their, their experience as well. Uh, Japan comes to mind. Um, other lessons learned is that all the problems that per were persistent pre-pandemic just, you know, were fuel for the fire of COVID-19. So all of the I mean, I, I've told the story to lots and lots of people. Before the pandemic, I would occasionally go to visit a client in a nursing home and there would be infection control precautions. So you would, when you got to their room, there would be, you know, yellow tape and big signs that said infection control precautions. There would be gloves and gowns and masks uh, and even the head coverings at the door. And you could, you know, you put them on and don them before you go in the, into the room and meet with the resident. And I would do that, those things. And while I'm in there talking to my client, the staff would go in and out and they wouldn't put the gloves on. They wouldn't put the masks on. They weren't, they were completely ignoring all the precautions. And these were the healthcare providers. Um, so there was a lot of shortcutting infection control procedures. And why were they shortcutting? It's not because they wanted to so much. It's because they felt compelled to because the facility was so short staffed, they didn't have enough time to meet all the needs of the residents. And so one of the first things you're gonna do is you're gonna ah, forget the gloves and, and the gown. That take, every time I do that, it takes two minutes. Over the course of the day, I'm losing half an hour. I, I got so many things to take care of. This is not gonna be one of them. So all these, the, under, the chronic understaffing, the chronic shortcutting um, is another area where in, in the non-enforcement of the requirements, the regulatory requirements um, really sort of came back to haunt us. So the facilities were just not in the habit of doing good infection control, of having enough staff to meet the needs of the residents. And it just, it was too big of a ship to turn around 180 degrees during a, you know, March of 2020. Um, we, have, we have data before the pandemic from 2004 actually, that where the CDC estimates that 
almost 400,000 long-term care residents died every year from preventable infections. So um, I think during the, at least in California, we've had 9,000 nursing home residents and about 4,000 assisted living residents die. So that's 13,000. I mean, that's not even an average, according to the CDC estimates, an average year of infection, infectious related deaths, not even close. Um, so we had long, long standing infection control problems, long standing understaffing problems. And um, during the pandemic, it just contributed to all the death and sickness that we saw. Yeah, the things that we should have been paying attention to a long time ago. Yes, yeah, so now turning to the, you know, the more optimistic opportunities here, like I said, we have seven bills in the California legislature, they could use everybody's support. It's a good year for supporting bills because um, you, don't, you no longer have to travel to Sacramento really to, to tell legislators that you support a bill. All the hearings now are available telephonically to the public, you can chime in your support. One way to sort of track the bills and support them is to go on our website and become a Canner member. It's, it's, there's no cost to it. You're just let, giving us your email address and we will inform you, we'll send you alerts of to give, critical give bills. Give people that website. If you, What's that? Give people the website, right? Well, yeah, the website is uh, canhr.org, stands for California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, canhr.org. And on the homepage, there's a button that says, you know, subscribe or join Canner. And then you can sign up for legislative alerts and become part of that, part of that process. The, the plan that we have in, in the Capitol right now is called the PROTECT plan, P-R-O-T-E-C-T, -E PROTECT plan. It's the seven bills. And then we're also doing a lot of work on the regula regulatory side. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion at the national level in Congress about reform bills. I, I think we're gonna have some momentum for at least the next couple of years to do some major things. Excellent, thank you, Susan. I think that's a great, great way to wrap it up. Back to back to you. Um, well, thank you so much, Tony. I, I guess we have a minute. So if there's anybody um, who wants to unmute themselves and ask a question, we can do that now. Um, otherwise, we can end. I don't, we've been planning on these are supposed to be 45 minutes. We've gone long on some of some of our Q and A's, but it looks like we're finished for the day. So just everybody, this will, we will have this captioned, this video captioned of the, this great presentation, and we'll be sending it out, a link out to it by early, by Tuesday or Wednesday of next week. And it'll also be up on DREDF's website at www.dredf.org. So thanks again, Tony. I really appreciate this. Oh, you're we welcome. all appreciate Thanks it. for the opportunity. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Tony. Thanks for Bye. your